Gil. Thank you very much. If I'm talking too fast, please let me know. <laughs> so I'm from the Ohio State University, which is a Midwestern state in uh, the United States, and it's one of the largest undergraduate institutions. These are some photos of our beautiful oval where undergraduates do things like play frisbee uh, when uh, the weather gets nice. I'm in an academic medical center that partners with a children's hospital, and that children's hospital is Nationwide Children's Hospital, and almost all of the work that I do is in collaboration with Nationwide Children's Hospital. Um, I run a biomechanics lab, which you can see in these pictures um, below, where we put uh, markers on um, infants' arms and legs and track their movements in 3D space. This is similar technology that's used to make animation video games and Hollywood uh, movies. But I'm going today to discuss um, clinical and observational assessments that are used in the research lab to assess early motor development. So I was very inspired by the title of this seminar series, looking at ultra early movements in uh, neurodevelopment in infancy. And that made me think about what is ultra early movement. And we know that there's movement in utero. So um, in the in utero environment is an interactive environment. The, we know that there are first body movements at seven, we, seven weeks of gestational age, and we know that some patterns of movements, startles, um, isolated limb movements, happen at eight to 12 weeks. Um, we know that there's variability in movement, and variability is an important uh, concept when we're talking about motor skills and movement. And we know later in gestation that babies, that fetuses kick, and in fact, we ask mothers to document kicking, and if kicking is decreased, that can be an indication of some, some risk. We know that babies can grasp the umbilical cord or even put their fingers in their mouth in utero. And we, there are very powerful images of, of fetal surgery where you can see even the fetus grasping the surgeon's uh, finger. So we know that very early movement happens um, in, in utero. So this, can you play this video? So this is a full-term baby, but a baby who's at high risk because he has a congenital heart condition, and I'm going to use um, congenital heart conditions as an example um, in this talk. So here, it, this baby is full term, but you can see this baby is moving. There is lots of spontaneous movement of the arms, of the legs, of the mouth, of the neck. This baby is kicking. This baby is swiping. So when we talk about early movements in infancy, we often think about movements of the whole body. And there is a tool called the general movement analysis that I will talk more about that looks at these, all of these types of movements. So the movements can last from just a second to a few minutes. Um, there's lots of variability in how the arms and the legs and the trunk and the neck and the mouth uh, move. The speed waxes and wanes, so the movement can go from very slow to very quick to there can be ballistic swipes of the arms, uh, fast kicks of the legs, or slow, um, slower movements. In general, these very ultra-early movements usually start with a slow progression at the beginning and a slow progression at the end with a faster speed in the middle. And there's often a sequence of flexion and extension of the limbs with some sort of rotational component. And overall, these movements are considered complex. Can you start this video too? This is the same video, but just keep in mind some of that language. So gradual start to the movement. There's movement of the legs, right leg kicking, left leg kicking, extension, now the arms start to move also in a slow way. 
There is an arm touching the head. There is an infant tremor. That is normal. The infant is touching the clothes. The infant is sometimes has the hands near midline and sometimes uses more of the space. There is very little repetition of movement here. There's lots of complexity. So we heard from the first speaker today that vision could be a window of intelligence and movement at this age is considered a window into the central nervous system. So what is the central nervous system's integrity? And this, the idea of um, the general movement analysis and other early motor tools are different than a neurological exam. We're not talking about an assessment of tone or reflexes here, we're talking about an assessment of movement more holistically. So one of the tools that we have been using in my lab and has been used in many um, countries is called the general movement assessment. And this is a specific tool, um, Prechtel's method of qualitative assessment of general movements. And the terminology of the tool is often abbreviated to GMA. And then the behaviors you see, general movements, are often abbreviated as GMs. So that's the language you, you might hear. Um, there are two periods, and these are based on age. There's a writhing period, which is the preterm and term age period. And during the writhing period, you can have normal writhing movements, or you can have abnormal writhing movements. And the categories for abnormal writhing movements are poor repertoire, chaotic, and cramp synchronous. Cramped synchronous, in particular, is, pre is predictive of cerebral palsy. Then at a later age range, 90 to 20 weeks post-term um, age, is the fidgety period. And fidgety movements are these small, bebopping movements that uh, slightly older infants um, show when you just lay them you know, in supine on, on the floor or on a blanket. Um, there, are no there are also categories of normal and abnormal. Normal, uh, or excuse me, abnormal, you can have um, exaggerated fidgety movements or absent fidgety movements. And absent fidgety movements are also predictive of cerebral palsy. So the general movement analysis really uses a gestalt holistic approach. There's not a lot of counting. You're watching the baby and you're making a judgment based on these categories on how, they, how their movement fits into these um, particular categories. And this is, um, this is a scoring sheet that is published in, in the general movement uh, textbook. And you can see that um, it shows gestational age, the writhing period, the fidgety periods. So you categorize the children based, or the infants based on their movement patterns, but you can also look at trajectory over time. So it is possible to look at the trajectory of the, these GMs over, over time. So in terms of cerebral palsy, in 2017, this paper was published. And this was a very um, important paper in using earlier assessment and motor uh, tests to predict and even diagnose um, cerebral palsy. And this was, a, you can see this large group is very international. It spans many European countries, the US, Australia, and beyond. And um, what, so just to back up a quick minute, cerebral palsy is a group of neurological disorders that appear in early infancy and affect body movement and coordination. Motor is a main uh, component of cerebral palsy. And we know that it's caused by damage um, to the developing brain. And um, I am a physical therapist by clinical training. I only uh, do research and teaching, but I, a lot of my work focuses on rehabilitation. And for children with cerebral palsy, we classify them based on their functional skills. It's called the Gross Motor Classification Function System, or the GMFCS. And this is just a way to classify uh, CP based on function. So children in level one can walk up uh, stairs. Could you play just the first few seconds of this video, please? Um, this is a child with cerebral palsy classified as level one. You can see that she can very easily 
uh, walk and even run um, around her environment, and she's supposed to be stepping over that. Uh, <laughs> manipulative right there, but she um, picked it up. Okay, you can pause the video. And then in le you can play these videos too, thank you. Um, and then this is a child in GMFCS level five. So children in GMFCS level five have little to no voluntary movement. They are in a wheelchair and often someone else is driving that powered wheelchair for them. So all of these functional, syst all of these functional levels are all cerebral palsy. So it's very much an umbrella um, term that spans severity uh, range. So historically, cerebral palsy has been diagnosed at greater than 19 months of age. And if we think about our second talk today, about all of the uh, brain migration that's happening during the fetal period when these injuries take place, this means that in terms of rehabilitation treatment, we're tre treating children 19 months to two years later than their brain injury. And this is a big problem. So this paper highlighted a concept called high risk of CP, and this is now being used more commonly um, in, health, in health services when people come to see a physician or a, a therapist or a team of evaluation. So um, if you look here at this highlight, highlighted part, the Prechtel's um, general movement analysis had a 98% sensitivity in predicting CP. So, and the, there were two um, types of GMs during the writhing period, cramped synchronous, and during the fidgety period, absent fidgety. When you combine this with MRI, it's even higher, um, but uh, one thing I also like about this body of work is that general movements can be done in low resource settings as well as high resource settings. Um, so, now, um, it's really important for a couple reasons for reducing the age of diagnosis of CP. Um, that's because we actually have interventions in infancy that work for children with CP or improve their motor skills. And for example, we know that as soon as you get a CP diagnosis, infants and toddlers need to immediately be uh, referred for monitoring of hip dysplasia. And we know that if children have a hemiparetic form of CP where one side of their body is affected more than the other, that we can get them into a constraint-induced movement therapy program or a bimanual therapy program to improve their upper extremity skills. Without a cerebral palsy diagnosis, it's, it does not make sense to do a constraint-induced movement therapy um, program, so this is one reason why it's um, very important. Um, so, but this work, has, sometimes it takes a long time for work to sort of trans, uh, transition into the clinic or be implemented into the clinic, but using GMs and using these combinations of early motor skills with imaging have had a kind of a quick uptake into hospital systems and especially academic medical centers. And so here's a single site's implementation study in Australia where they implemented uh, this. This paper is by um, a colleague of mine who uh, works within a network of hospital systems, and they um, reduced the age of CP diagnosis from 19 months to 9.5 uh, months. So this is, you know, these are really powerful uh, messages with large, large sample sizes, and these are in the clinic. So this is not a research study. This is they implemented these tools in the clinic, and they were able to reduce the age of, of diagnosis. Um, so these two periods of general movement assessment, I highlighted the two categories, cramped synchronous in the writhing period and absent fidgety in the fidgety period because those are predictive of CP. But there are several other categories that are, not, that are considered abnormal. And the, the literature that is emerging now is that these categories might be very important for global neurodevelopmental delay with... Um, with autism being, you know, one of the, of the autism and ADHD being some of the areas that are really being highlighted. Um, so we have used these tool, this tool specifically the GMA in my lab to look at infants with complex congenital heart uh, disease. So congenital heart disease are structural abnormalities of the heart. They are. They often um, are major malformations of the heart that require um, surgery in the first uh, few years of life. 
They are the most common congenital, congenital disorder in newborns. And globally, there are um, 1.5 million children with complex congenital heart um, disease. This paper was just recently um, uh, published. So there, this population of complex congenital heart disease, they, the babies are at risk for neurodevelopmental delays. And we know that there's a really complex relationship between the heart and the brain and probably the placenta. Um, um, and that there is, we also know that infants with complex congenital heart disease have a five-fold increased risk of cerebral palsy. But in general, the idea of testing neurodevelopment early in this population has not been done as much. And we think this is because most of the time the intervention is life-saving. They're, they're waiting for life-saving surgery. So neurodevelopment is a little bit on the, on the back um, burner. So we know that infants with, with complex congenital heart disease do not develop at the same trajectory as their peers, and there's a lot of information that at school age they show delays in um, academic skills. And we, we also look to our professional organizations for some guidance, and the, um, the American Heart Association does have a statement about the importance of earlier screening for neurodevelopment because the, with these surgeries, the vast majority of children are, are living you know, full lives. They're in their 30s and 40s now from when these first surgeries were, were performed. Um, so our study design was a prospective longitudinal cohort study. We had two aims. We did first want to look at the risk of CP in this population because my lab studies cerebral palsy and this is a high risk for cerebral palsy population. And then we wanted to see if we could identify neurodevelopmental impairments in infants with um, congenital heart disease before six months of age. And we did use a healthy full-term comparison group in this study. So these are our um, study participant characteristics. We had 28 infants with complex congenital heart disease. And you can see that they did have a range of cardiac diagnoses, as is expected. And we were about split between single ventricle pathology and um, two ventricle, or excuse me, single ventricle physiology and two ventricle physiology. And their age at surgery is on the bottom. They were around 10 days of age when they had their first surgery. Um, so if we go back to the general movement um, analysis, we looked at the writhing period and the fidgety period. And remember that abnormal categories are um, poor repertoire, cramped synchronous, and chaotic. And in the fidgety period, it's absent fidgety or abnormal fidgety. So um, we also looked at two other assessment tools. One is called the TIMP, the Test of Infant Motor Performance. That is a tool that is used routinely in the US for preterm babies, especially um, in the NICU. So we used the TIMP. And this is also a tool that I, that I like a lot. And the Bailey, uh, Bailey Scales of Infant Development, the Bailey Scales of Infant Development in the US is one of the most commonly used tools. It spans multiple domains of development, gross motor, fine motor, language, cognition, adaptive behavior. Um, and so on. And the Bailey is often used, it's a little bit state dependent, but is often used to decide if a child qualifies for services. So if they score below one standard deviation or two standard deviations, you can make an argument that they should be referred to physical therapy or occupational therapy or, or speech therapy. Um, so we did do some independent t tests and we used an ANOVA. Um, and looked at some effect sizes in this um, sample. So you can see um, the writhing period and the fidgety periods here. You can see that um, we had 44% of the infants with complex congenital heart disease who had normal writhing, and then the rest had some sort of abnormal writhing using the GMA, using the general movement assessment. And then in the fidgety period, um, we had 84% who had normal fidgety, so we could also look a little bit at trajectory. And then we had some who had absent fidgety, uh, four infants who had absent fidgety, and those four infants who had absent fidgety did have abnormal GMs in the earlier um, time period. If we look at the test of um, infant motor performance, the TIMP, uh, we had a 
complex congenital heart disease group and a healthy group, and you can see that there, is, there was a difference in motor performance at three um, months of age. And this is the Bailey uh, scales of infant development with on the x-axis there's cognition, receptive language, expressive language, fine motor, and gross motor. And you can see that at three months is the top graph, six months is the bottom graph. And you can see that language was not identified as a difference between the groups, but the other domains of development were. We also looked at some change over time in terms of motor development, and in terms of gross motor uh, development, there was a main effect of time, a main effect of group, and a group interaction, which means that not only are the infants different, but that the typically developing infants, their slope is higher, so they're, they're progressing at a faster uh, rate. And there were no, um, there were significant group and time effects for cognitive language and fine motor domain. And then this bottom part here about how many infants scored below um, two standard deviations is um, related to what I mentioned before about how we might refer infants for services. And most of the time, infants with complex congenital heart defects are not referred for rehabilitation services quite yet. And we think that this data uh, shows that they should be. Um, so I've talked about the GMA as, as this holistic uh, measure that we can use to categorize normal and abnormal movements at these two times. But there is also something called the motor optimality score, and it was revised in 2019. So this, the optimality score um, partially uses the GMA, but it is a, it's an outcome measure. So there's a numeric value and you can use it pre and post uh, treatment. And in the writhing period, you can, the infant can get a score of up to uh, 42, and in the fidgety period, they can get a score of up to 28. And this, this is more typical of what you might think of as a motor measure. You might look at, does the baby bring their hands to midline? Does the baby um, touch their feet to their feet? Um, do they show a variety of different kinds of movements? Do they use the whole uh, space, the whole space that they, they take up? So you can score uh, this from the same video that you used to score the GMA. And what I, another thing I like about this tool is that a lot of the papers have had parents collect the videos. So the video I showed you earlier on, oops, excuse me, uh, was, was in the, the PICU, so we, we collected the video on, with a video camera, but when the infants go home, parents can collect them on cell phones. And there are a couple apps that are available. The one I'm most familiar with is called Baby Moves, and that's Alicia Spittle's work um, out of, in, Mel in Melbourne. And so the parent takes this video of their baby for three minutes. Um, you, can't, you can't really see it on the cell phone screen, but there's a little outline to make sure that the baby stays in the whole view, because if you're missing part of the view, you can't score uh, the test. And then they can return it to the researcher or the clinician who can then score the GMA or score the motor optimality um, score. Um, so the motor optimality score has been used. There are two very important recent papers that have looked at preterm infants using the motor optimality score, and they, there are very, very strong correlations between this score at around three months of age and uh, two-year outcomes, and this is across cognition, language, and motor. So, and the, this was not a population that was at particularly high risk for cerebral palsy. It was at a more, it, the population was more at risk for global neurodevelopmental delay. Um, one other tool that we use in my laboratory is the mobile paradigm, and I just wanted to mention this briefly because I, um, we, talked, we have talked a lot about spontaneous movements of infants, but we can also look at how they learn using the motor system. So for the, in the mobile paradigm, there are, there's a baseline acquisition and an extinction period. Uh, so you have to think back to intro to psych if you're, if you're not a, a psychologist, um, where uh, you place the baby in a pack and play or in a crib. There are two um, mobile stands. The mobile can be moved from one stand to the other, 
and the infant's leg is tethered to the mobile. So can you play this video, please? So this is a baby in the mobile paradigm in the baseline condition. So you can see that the infant's leg is tethered to the mobile, but the mobile is on the other stand. So when the baby kicks, they can still feel the, um, they can feel the tether, but their kicking does not make the mobile move um, at, at all. So this is baseline. And can you play this video, please? And then acquisition, this is the learning period. Now that it, when the infant kicks, the mobile moves, and there's this conjugate uh, um, relationship between infant kicking and mobile movement. And then you repeat the baseline condition, now called extinction, and then you can look at the number of kicks and get an indication of learning. So we also looked at, um, we use a software, a free behavioral coding software called DataView, where we can uh, count the number of kicks and we can scroll back and forth in the video and we can look frame by frame at 60 frames per, per second. And we can look at the um, number of kicks of the tethered leg and of the, of the non-tethered leg. And this paradigm has an incredibly long history in, in developmental psychology. And we looked at infants with complex congenital heart disease, in fact, the same sample that, that you saw some of the motor data for. And we found that those infants learned on the first day, but they did not remember on the second day. And this is a similar pattern to what we see in babies with Down syndrome. Um, typical healthy infants learn on the first day and can rem remember it for up to a week later. And if you remind them, they even remember it for longer um, than that. Um, these are, I just want to thank real quickly uh, for, the, for all of the work with the um, congenital heart disease patients. Um, these are my collaborators, and our funding source was the American Heart Association. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jill. Uh, is there any question in the audience? No, so we have a question in the, in the chat that Claire will. Uh... Thanks, Jill. So we have several questions in the chat. Uh, one is concerning the preterm infants at high risk of CP. At what age exactly do you observe the absence of fidgety? Is it between 9 and 20 weeks post-term corrected or 9 and 20 weeks real postnatal age? So, okay. It is um, their age, um, not, it's not corrected age, it's their, their age. Um, for, fidg for fidgety movements, let me rephrase that, I think I misspoke. Um, if we look at the, you can do general movements in the preterm age for the um, writhing movements, then you reach term age, and then it's nine, to 20 weeks after term age. Okay. Uh, the second question is, would you think it's interesting to systematize the observation of GMs for population particularly at risk of developing CP, such as premature newborns? And if so, would it be possible to automatize the observation? So there are a lot of people working on uh, machine learning algorithms to try to automatize GMs and GMAs. There have been papers using uh, pressure mats. There have been papers using similar kinds of icon markers that, that I use on the arms and the legs and the trunk. And they are making some progress in doing that, but it is, it's not quite there yet. And then there are also algorithms that are using pixels uh, you know, of the video, and when you have a, but you need a lot of data. You need a lot of, of data points to be able to use these kinds of techniques. Uh, but I do think that that is a strong possibility for the future. Okay, sorry, I have a third question. <laughs> is uh, how do you explain the absence of fidgets are not predictive of a specific category of neurodisabilities? Because they have been observed both in uh, infants which, who later develop uh, CP, but also in uh, infants with uh, later uh, autism. So if I understand the question correctly, or can you repeat the first part of the question? Uh, 
the question is uh, the relationship between the uh, absent fidgeties and the category of no disabilities. Yeah. So right now, absent fidgety is, has a sensitivity of 98% to predict CP. There are, though, false negatives. There are some children who have fidgety movements but who um, later develop CP. In terms of neurodevelopment, poor neurodevelopment in general, that is something the field is still working on. I mean, we're also still working on getting better at CP diagnosis, but the um, different categories to predict global neurodevelopment is something that seems promising, but is still being worked out. Thank you very much, Jill. Uh, is there some specific patterns, motor patterns, that we can observe in uh, very preterm babies that we never observed in uh, full-term babies? So the writhing movements, if we're talking about the GMA, the writhing movements at term age for full-term babies are different than uh, preterm babies. You have physiological flexion. The baby is usually has usually has more fat. They don't do some of these movements, but when you learn how to do the tool, you sort of learn how to identify each um, each kind of pattern. Um, I think the idea is that some of the movements in the preterm period that we're seeing in this gravity-based environment would be the same as what you see in utero in this non-gravity-based um, environment where they're exploring the walls of the uterus and getting feedback from, being, from it being you know, pushing, um, and it's kind of an adaptive, interactive um, environment. Did you check, I mean, uh, in utero what's going on? I mean, I have not checked what's going on, but I've seen videos <laughs> of some, my own children. And there are <laughs> fetal movement scales. So people have done this and there, um, and even looked at some M MRI of fetal uh, movements. And some of the qualities of the movement are, are similar to when you see a preterm baby moving. Thank you very much, Jill. <laughs> Thank you.